You're listening to an Axe Church sermon. Axe Church Northwest is located in Vancouver, Washington, and we have services meeting each week at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. You can also join us online live at our 11 a.m. service each Sunday. If you'd like to know more about Axe Church Northwest, you can go to axechurchnw.org. Now enjoy the sermon. Today I want to talk about uh, evangelism, and I want to talk about discipleship, and I want to talk about vision. Uh, what happened with me is I started to work on our next sermon for Psalms 4, and I had a lot of notes and a lot of stuff ready to go, and I started to work on it, and I thought, you know, uh, I'm feeling really passionate about some things that we've been talking about and some things that we want to do, and I want to get the church uh, connected with this, and so I was going to do maybe 10 or 15 or 20 minutes talking about that and then get into Psalm 4. By the time I got done uh, working on and preparing the, the section on what we're going to be doing, there was no room left for Psalm 4. So in the interest of uh, not spending all day on Sunday uh, talking, uh, we're going to be just talking about that this morning. And so uh, let's get into it. Most of us know what evangelism is. If you don't, uh, evangelism is bringing the good news, the good news of the gospel to the people of the world, to the lost, to the broken, to those who need forgiveness, those who need Jesus, which is everyone. Uh, evangelism is bringing that message and teaching them what it looks like to see them become a follower and a disciple of Jesus Christ. So that's what evangelism is. And remember, our mission as Christ followers is the Great Commission, the Great Commission that Jesus gave to his disciples, and we are his disciples, and this is what it is. It's out there on the wall. We talk about it a lot because it defines the mission for our lives. And this is what it says, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. I'm reading out of the New King James Version. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So this is our great commission. In evangelism, we make disciples for Jesus Christ. That means that the message of the gospel must be proclaimed. That's an important word. And here, I looked it up in Merriam-Webster online uh, in the dictionary here. It says, this is what it says pro, to proclaim means. To declare publicly, typically insistently, proudly or defiantly in either speech or writing. That is to announce, it says, to announce. The second definition, to give outward indication of, to show. We proclaim by announcing, whether that's through our words, through our writing, whatever, but also through our actions, we show it. We give outward indication of. So when we proclaim the gospel, we do both of those. And it says to declare or to declare to be solemnly, officially, or formally. And the last one is to praise or glorify openly or publicly. To praise or glorify openly or publicly. So we have to announce the good news. We have to announce it. We have to show the good news of the gospel in the way that we live, in the way that we talk, in the way that we treat people, in the things that we say, in the things that we do. We show, we show, we give outward indication of the truth of the gospel, right? We show that we're free, that we're saved, that we're redeemed, that we have no fear, that we live in peace and love and in community. Those things are, are being shown and being spoken and written in every other way that we communicate. We proclaim the gospel. That is our job. That's how we make disciples of Jesus Christ. But we also, in doing so, we're able to praise and glorify, as it says, in, even in Merriam-Webster, says to praise or glorify openly or publicly. When we proclaim the gospel, we praise and glorify God openly and publicly. That's what our lives are about. Anything that we're doing where that doesn't fit, where it can't be done, where we cannot either say or write or show the truth of the gospel openly and publicly does not fit with who we are as Christ followers. If you're in a situation or a place and you think, I can't praise or glorify or, or, or openly and publicly the Lord, it, minimally through my actions, but preferably through my words, through my writing, through my communication, and through all of that, if you're in that kind of a place, it's not a great place for a Christ follower because your mission is to do this. Your mission is to do this. So we proclaim the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, who came as a man, who died, who rose again on the third day, and who defeated death and sin and hell and has given us the opportunity to be saved, to be clean, to be cleansed. 
That is the message that we are sending. That is the message that we are proclaiming. We proclaim the good news. We proclaim that there's freedom. People are bound up right now. They are bound up in fear, in anxiety. They don't know what's coming next. All you hear is 2020, oh my gosh, the worst thing that's ever happened. And, and you know, uh, the, what's next? What's gonna, what else is gonna happen? There's a lot of fear. There's a lot of difficulty. They're bound up and we're proclaiming freedom and peace in the gospel because when we're free from our own sin and we know who we are in Christ, we're free. We're free and we have peace. So we're proclaiming that. We're proclaiming truth and life because Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. That's what we proclaim. We do so without fear, we do so without shame, and we do so in a way that is effective. Effective, like the purpose that we're trying to achieve is going to be achieved because the way that we've chosen to do it makes sense. So we wanna do it effectively, effectively. The next thing is discipleship. Uh, we, most of us know what discipleship is at some level, but discipleship is an ongoing process. It's something we do both as disciplers of our brothers and sisters in Christ and as disciples of Christ being taught and discipled by our brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, that's, that's what we do, and we do it for as long as we live. Okay? Discipleship is a process that you're both giving and receiving as a Christ follower for your entire life. You're discipling your children who will grow up to know Jesus and will disciple others. Meanwhile, you're being discipled by others who are also being discipled by others. It's a multiplication process. Those of you who don't like math and don't like multiplication, at least you know this. Multiplication makes numbers get big quick. And that's what discipleship is. It multiplies the body of Christ as we disciple each other and that builds out. So discipleship, it begins at the time that we call on the name of Jesus for salvation. It begins at the time when we say Jesus is Lord. We say God rose him from the dead. We need forgiveness of our sins. We're coming to him to be clean. When that happens and we choose to be Christ followers, discipleship begins. And the first step in discipleship is obediently going through the process of water baptism. Water baptism is showing, proclaiming to the world. It's one of the ways we proclaim the glory of God. It's one of the ways we praise God and it's one of the ways that we show that we are identified with Christ, that we are buried and raised with him, that we are clean in him and that we're identified with him for the rest of our lives. We do that publicly. It's a proclamation of our identity with Christ. And so we do that. We say we are followers of Jesus Christ. The next step is the ongoing process of learning, learning ourselves and teaching others to observe all things that Jesus has commanded us. Learning ourselves and teaching others to observe all things that Jesus has commanded us. That's what discipleship looks like. And here's the thing. Discipleship is an intensive process. It's an intensive process. It's not a, something we do every once in a while, kind of a once a week or a once a month thing. It's an intensive process all the time, every day. That's what discipleship looks like. We don't do it occasionally. We do it consistently. It literally defines the way we live our lives. We are disciples. That means that definitionally we are being discipled and discipling that is who we are as people in the body of Christ. And so when we think about what it looked like originally, Jesus Christ had 12 disciples. Well, what was that like? Well, they lived with him every day. They walked with him. That he taught them constantly and consistently. It was just who they were. They were his disciples. That was defined by the fact that they followed him. And so we also have to be defined by the fact that we follow him, that we live with him, that we walk with him. And we do that through the body of Christ that's here in his church in the power of the Holy Spirit. And then the disciples continued to be disciples after Jesus came, died, rose again, and ascended to heaven when the Holy Spirit was sent upon the church at Pentecost. And they continued to be taught and to teach others and to be active. And the Holy Spirit, he has been active in the church ever since then and continues to be active in the church, showing us what's true and discipling us both directly from the Holy Spirit and through one another. That's how it works. So, the life of the Christ follower is a life of constant, ongoing discipleship. If that is not the definition, if it's not defining our lives right now, if we looked at our lives and said, am I a disciple? Mm, I don't know. 
this, I, you know, I go to church sometimes or, you know, I go to church quite a bit, but I don't do much else. There's not a lot about my daily life that would, that would someone would look at and be like, wow, you're really a disciple. You're really a follower of Christ. They might say, you're kind of a, uh, I think some people use the word a fan. We're not a fan, we're a follower, right? And so it's not just something that we're like, yeah, Christianity is great and I'm kind of a part of that. It literally is definitional. It defines how we live. If we can't say that about ourselves, we need to fix that because we're supposed to be Christ followers. We're supposed to be constantly following Christ in a way that is effective for our own growth and efficient, meaning that we're choosing ways to disciple that are not just aimed at accomplishing that goal, but are the quickest and most effective way to get to that goal, efficiency. So we're going to be effective and efficient followers of Christ. Now, in this world, before we used to all carry little computers around in our pockets that we call cell phones, before that happened, we used to talk to each other, and that was a thing that people did. We used to talk to each other a lot more often face-to-face. -face. That was what the world looked like. We talked face-to-face. -face. We talked on the phone. I know that most of us, or a lot of us, mostly it's the texting. You know, we're texting each other, but back in the day, we used to talk on the phone. It actually took, you had to really commit. We had one of those phones in my house where you had to dial it like this. Every, zzz, zzz, zzz. So you had to commit. You were going to call somebody, right? We called people on the phone. We even used to write letters to each other. And I know for some of you that are younger than me, you're thinking, write letters, or maybe you've gotten a letter and you're like, what is this person doing writing a letter, right? Because we have email, we have message, and we have all these ways. But that's the way we used to communicate. It was much more personal, uh, much more face-to-face, -face, and had much more of a personal touch to it. I'm guessing that a lot of you, like I say, again, younger than me, don't remember what a long-distance phone call is. A long-distance phone call was a phone call to anywhere that was outside your area code. So like if, if we were here in Vancouver and wanted to call to Portland, just the 503 area code from the 360 area code. Although back in the day, I think we were 206 or everyone in Washington was. Anyway, it doesn't matter. If we wanted to call just across the river, we paid extra money to do it. And we did it. We paid it. We paid to call long distance because we wanted to speak and hear someone's voice and speak to each other. We don't really do that anymore. And of course, there's no such thing as long distance. You can call anywhere in the United States for the same price now. But we couldn't text. We couldn't get in touch with each other that way. It was more of a face-to-face -face world. It was more of a voice-to-voice -voice world. But that's changed. That's changed. Communication has changed. The way we learn has changed quite a bit. The way we take in information has changed. The way we interact with our communities has changed. All of those things have changed. And I'm not interested this morning in talking about whether those changes have been a good thing or whether they have been a bad thing. That's, I'm not interested in talking about that. It doesn't matter because it's a reality. It is what has happened. The fact is that it has changed. Now, when we think about efficiency and when we think about effectiveness, what we have to think about is if the way that people learn and communicate and connect with one another has changed, then the way that we disciple the methods, not the content, but the methods also have to change. When Paul wanted to connect with people, as he'd go into a new city, he wanted to connect to people, he went into the places where communication, where effective and efficient discipleship and proclamation of the gospel could happen, which were different for them then than they are for us now. Some people who, who we talked to would follow Jesus, some would not, but he found the most efficient and effective way to connect with them. He would proclaim the gospel to them from the scriptures. He'd start in the synagogue where people knew the scriptures, and he would proclaim the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Some would accept Christ, some would not. Then when that was done, he would go out into the city to the Gentiles and find the places where they gathered and where they listened so that he could proclaim the gospel to them there and disciple people there, okay? And so when he did that, he'd go to basically the marketplaces. Listen to this. This is from Acts 17, 16 through 21. And it just sort of shows Paul's method in the city of Athens. So listen. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him. And some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus saying, may we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak. For you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. 
For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. So there's a lot of, of connections between what Paul was facing and what we face now, several. One of which is Paul saw the truth that is still the truth today that people follow idols, that they're idol worshipers. They follow those things, people and things and ideas and whatever that are worthless to them as far as their salvation is concerned, that are worthless to them as far as truth and what's spiritually true. He recognized that about them. They worshiped worthless things and worthless ideas. So he goes to the synagogue and he goes to the marketplace to present the truth of the gospel and to disciple those who were following Christ. And eventually what happens is, as he continues to do this in the marketplace where the people gathered, sort of the more uh, well-known folks in Athens, the philosophers, philosophers and so on said, why did you come talk to us at our kind of special place here at the Areopagus, this group of philosophers and so on? They wanted to hear the new idea. So while Paul was being effective in just efficient, effective proclamation of the gospel and discipleship, what happened is he gained opportunities to talk to more people and to talk to people with more influence. And so Paul went to the Areopagus. You can read about that in Acts 17. He gave a message there and some some thought it was nonsense and some believed Christ and followed him. Uh, but that's the process that we go through to efficiently and effectively proclaim the gospel and disciple. So the world changed through that method of evangelism and discipleship. That method was effective to literally change the world over the course of a few hundred years the world changed from being pagan and idolatrous to more and more and more people to where it became a huge and, and influential group of people were following Christ. And the, the pattern was very simple. We have the message, we have the scripture, we have the gospel, we know how to disciple. And the question is, what are the methods that we're going to use? Paul wanted to be effective and he wanted to be efficient. So what he did is he took advantage of what existed. At that time, the Romans had built roads all throughout the Roman world. And they had shipping, ships that would go to all these different places. So Paul utilized that to get himself to far away places and influential cities to preach the gospel and to disciple people. He was able to do that. And then the same roads and ships were used as a means to carry information. So Paul wrote epistles or just letters is what we would call them. Now, a number of those are what are in the New Testament as scripture today because they were inspired by the Holy Spirit. So he'd write letters to churches to continue to communicate with them. That's how he did it. Paul also taught consistently and constantly. It wasn't a one and done thing. It wasn't a one day thing. It wasn't just a Sunday morning thing. Listen to this. Acts 19, 8 through 10. And he went into the synagogue and spoke, spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. But when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from them and withdrew the disciples. So he takes the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. And this continued for two years so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. So Paul goes from the synagogue for three months. He's reasoning. When, once that's rejected, he takes those that had accepted the message and he goes and daily in the school of Tyrannus, this place, and if you listen back to our Acts message, you can understand more about the historical side of that. But he's got this place and he's teaching every single day discipling, proclaiming the gospel, proclaiming the good news, and teaching people to obey all that Jesus had commanded. And through that daily consistent ministry that was both efficient and effective in a large city, what happened was that it says, all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. By Paul teaching daily, he was able to do those things. And so, as I said, there was a time when we used to talk to each other more often and things looked a little bit different. When I was younger, we would gather at church on Sunday morning, on Sunday night, and on Wednesday night. That was just like the weekly thing that we did, okay? Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. I think there were probably also other Bible studies that went on. There were also things like youth camps. I would go to like, you know, anywhere from one to four or five different camps during the summer uh, to, uh, that would be teaching the Bible and doing those kinds of things. It was, it was a consistent part of life. We, and they were, they were in person, no internet at the time, or at least not an internet that people used um, at the time. And so it was primarily done by consistent, regular, in-person communication. That's how we did it. So you would get 
on, on a normal week, you get three teachings from the scriptures, your Sunday morning teaching, your Sunday night teaching, and your Wednesday night teaching. Now things are a little bit different, okay? That's not the pattern of the life of the people of the church now, not any longer. And again, I'm not here to talk about or to comment or to work through or to analyze whether that's better or worse or a good or a bad thing. It is a reality. We're just not like that anymore. So we have to find the similarities between what Paul's time what they were doing to be efficient and effective communicators of the gospel and disciplers, proclaimers and disciplers. What was efficient for them? And what's similar about our time? Or what are things that are sort of like those things were for them and use those to be efficient and effective in working our mission, Christ's Great Commission, for us? So there are some things as we move forward in that that we continue to do now that I consider to be, not just I, the elders, the people in the church in general consider to be fundamental to the church, to who we are, to biblical Christianity. And we will continue to do those things and to put the majority of our efforts or the highest priority is these things, okay? And so a couple of those things are this, gathering together in person on Sunday mornings. That's not changing. That has been the pattern of the church since the beginning. It will be the pattern of the church until Christ comes. I firmly believe uh, even in places where there's persecution, they find ways to do that. So the regular weekly corporate gathering of the church to worship and praise God, to proclaim his name and to study from the scriptures and to have fellowship together, that's gonna happen. The second thing that we will continue to do because it is also fundamental to our life as the church is life groups, meeting in homes weekly, to fellowship, to confess and repent to one another, to pray for one another, and to study the scripture together. That will continue to be a fundamental part of our life as the church. So meeting in the temple and house to house, that kind of a thing is gonna to continue to happen. We wanna keep in mind that that is only two things during the week. That's a Sunday morning and that's whatever night you have your life group on, that's that night. Those are gonna be fundamental, those are gonna continue. Uh, but we're going we're gonna to be increasing the level of opportunity for proclamation of the gospel and for discipleship. That's the goal. So what the elders and the staff have been discussing over a number of months is uh, we're always thinking of ways to be more effective, to be more efficient, to reach um, our people with more teaching to reach the people in the world, those outside with more proclamation of the gospel, more teaching, more truth. How do we do that? Okay. And, and, and over time, we've, we've found ways to be more effective and to be more efficient with the gospel. In fact, you're right now, uh, all of us right now, as we're sitting watching this this morning, are seeing the effect of that goal and that vision and that commitment, which is that we're able now to do church online, live on Sunday mornings. That's been a goal for us. That's been something that we've put real time, effort, energy, money, all those things behind so that we had this method to reach people. Uh, another thing uh, that you may have seen or experienced and some of you are doing right now is orientation. Putting that class together as a package with daily devotionals, with the weekly teachings, with all those kinds of things so that it can, so that it can happen consistently, constantly, over and over and over. We have people going through that. That's another way that we were able to do something where we can multiply our efforts out by using technology. The same way Paul uses roads and ships to get the gospel, the same way he writes letters to get to the message to the churches, we're finding ways to do that with our current tools and our current technology to be efficient and effective with the gospel. So right now, we are continuing to work on new ways to become more effective and to effectively speak to the church as well as to the marketplace. So we wanna do those things well, but we will not be successful without walking in the will of the Father, without operating according to the power of the Holy Spirit and having the participation, the passionate participation, the passionate participation of the people who are the body of Christ. We have to have all of those things. We've got to be in the Father's will. We've got to be operating according to the power of the Holy Spirit. And we as a church, as a body, need to participate and work together to make these effective, efficient proclamations of the gospel and discipleship opportunities work and happen and be fruitful. That's, that's our goal. We want to be used by Christ as his church to do these things. So uh, 
We have studied a lot of the Bible here. We do that on Sunday mornings. If you've been with us for a long time, you know that's how we are. If you're relatively new, you'll see that's how we are. We study the scriptures. And one of the things that's been really clear in the teachings that we've been reading, both from the Sermon on the Mount and from these Psalms that we've been going through in the first several Psalms, and we're going to try to get through five of them uh, in this series, but we've seen these two paths become really, really clear. Two paths, the kingdom of God and the, and the, and the way of death, the way of the world right? The kingdom of Satan, however you want to describe that. You got God's kingdom, you got the narrow road, you got the road that goes to life, you got this wide road, this easy road that leads to death. Those are the two possibilities. And what's becoming more clear is that these roads are becoming very obvious to those of us who are walking with Christ, who have the Holy Spirit. The roads are, there's no more, there's no more hiddenness in it where, it's, where things are as unclear. It's becoming more and more clear which road is which as we walk the world, as the end of the age is coming. There's really no question. And a lot of believers, I think, because of a lot of things, and I, I think I'm guilty of this as much as anybody, maybe more than anybody at certain times in my life, and that is trying to sort of straddle both roads. You know, walk in the road, the road of the kingdom on Sundays and in this times, and then sort of walk in the road of the world when it's more convenient on that side. And it's just not, it never was possible. It makes us into lukewarm Christians that, that the Lord, that Jesus wants to spit out of his mouth because we're lukewarm and neither hot nor cold. Not only does it do that, it's just not possible. It's not possible to do that. And so we have to get to the point where we're fully committed to being followers of Christ and walking the right path. We have to do that. And we have to show the world what that path is so that they have a clear understanding. Those who are spiritually dead, they don't see the roads as differently. They don't see that, but we do. We need to show it clearly. Those of us who have been called to the kingdom must be fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. Fully devoted. I, wanna, I want you to think about what it means to be fully devoted. And I want us to let the Holy Spirit speak to our hearts about the places where we are not fully devoted. Every one of us needs to take steps forward in being fully devoted and commit ourselves to being fully devoted. So we have these two paths and our lives must resemble the lives of fully devoted Christ followers that have come before us. They've shown us, they've discipled us Christ has used them to disciple us, to show us what it looks like to be a fully devoted follower of Christ. And we can look back to the beginning and see that. Here's a description of the church after Pentecost, okay? Acts 2, 40 through 47. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them saying, be saved from this perverse generation. We also have a perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. They were used. The church was used effectively as they wanted to be to see people daily being saved, daily added to the church, daily becoming followers of Christ, part of the body of Christ. How? Well, this is their life. Daily in the temple and house to house. Walking in the apostles' doctrine, which we now have in Scripture, we have the doctrine of the apostles, in fellowship, in breaking of bread, and in prayers. This is the way of a disciple. This is what we do. This is what our life looks like. It's defined by these things. So what does it look like for us in the 20, 21st century, in 2020, what does it look like for us to walk like this? Well, first, it looks like some of the things we're already doing committing ourselves to sold out worship together and, and by ourselves, sold out worship, to study, to hospitality, to believers and to the loss, to giving of our time for the kingdom, to giving of our gifts that God has given us to the kingdom, to giving of our resources, our money to the kingdom of God. Second, it looks like more than just that, what we're doing. 
It looks like more attention being paid to growing in our relationship with Christ and to one another. More. It looks like more attention to learning to obey all that Jesus has commanded. More. It looks like more repentance. More turning from those things that look a lot like things that people on that other path do. Repenting, turning away from those things. Confessing them, repenting them, receiving forgiveness. For if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It looks like more of that. And it looks like more prayer. Going to the Lord more often about more things, praying for more people, interceding for people, asking the Lord for his favor upon people, asking that he would bring people to know him. More of that. More love for one another in the church. More love for the world that Jesus Christ gave his life for on the cross and rose again for and defeated death and sin and hell for that they might be able to be right with him. More love for them. It also looks like less. It looks like less. It looks like less selfishness. It looks like less laziness. It looks like less anger, less bitterness, less fear. It looks like less participation in the things of the world that would make the people of the world look at you and not be able to identify you as set apart for Jesus Christ. We need to do less of those things that make our friends and our family and the people around us look at us and say, what is different about that person? That doesn't seem much different. They seem to act like me and like everybody else. Less of that. Christ has made us clean. We need to walk like we are clean, like we are set apart. And that's work. And that's difficult. But that's the mission. To, to teach us to obey all that Jesus has commanded us. And he gives us the promise. And lo, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. We have him. Less participation in the things of the world. Less excuses. Boy, do I have excuses. I mean, I'm preaching to myself first with all this, but man, we can come up with some excuses, less excuses. Let's get on with it. Let's be fully devoted followers of Christ without excuses. Don't come to the Lord and say, well, I'll follow you, but let me go do this first. Let me go do that first. No, let's put our hand to the plow and not look back. Less excuses, less waiting to get started. Less, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get serious about it next month or next week or after Christmas or whatever. I'm going to get into a life where I really am. It really seems important. I'm going to do that next year, next month, next quarter, after this, after that. Well, I, you know, I'm looking, I have a wedding coming up or I have a funeral coming up or I have a whatever. When that's done, I'll get involved. Stop that. Less waiting to get started. Let's get started. God's calling you to whatever the next thing is in your life as far as discipleship. Less excuses and less waiting to get started. We got to get on with it. One of the things that I'm responsible for as, as your pastor, as a teaching pastor at Acts Church, is to institute opportunities for you to grow in Christ. That's part of my job, it's, and it's part of my passion, and I love it. I love growing in Christ. I love all of you who help me grow in Christ, the elders who help me and hold me accountable and help me grow in Christ. And I love you, and I want to help you grow in Christ. I want to disciple you as I'm being discipled. I want you to disciple us. That's what I want to see happen. So instead of saying, be a disciple, which we say lots of times because it's scriptural, but then not really giving us uh, a good idea of what that looks like practically and specifically and sort of expecting people to figure that on their own. We want to provide a clear way now, a clear way now to grow in discipleship effectively and efficiently. We want to be better at showing, at being together, at being in one accord and walking together in discipleship. So first, I want to share with you the general ideas that we are working on. And then I want to ask for your service as the body of Christ to, to walk with us in this. And so let's walk through sort of this plan. And I'm going to give you some things uh, a little later on that I want you to pray about and so on. So if you have your phone, you can take notes or a piece of paper and a pen or whatever it is that you can take notes with. I'm going to want you to write down some things to pray about later. So get that ready. So first, the church and the marketplace, what are they, right? And how are we going to connect to each other through them? So here's what I see as the marketplace and the way that we communicate with one another, with one another, with one another. 
There's three principal ways, I think, that, that we communicate with each other in this culture right now where we sit. And generally, I think, around the world, but really specifically here. In person, it's always going to be primary. Online, and that includes social media, YouTube, all these kinds of things, online. And then the last one is through messaging applications. We do a lot of messaging, whether that's text messaging or, or you know, iMessage, text message, SMS, whatever they are, right? And then you've got your Facebook Messenger and you've got, uh, you had all these different ones, right? WhatsApp and, and whatever. Uh, you're saying, you're like, this guy is so old. Listen, I don't know. I don't message on all these things, but there's a lot of messaging apps and we do a lot of messaging, personal messaging, instant messaging. And so that, those are the three ways that I see people connecting and communicating with one another right now. Discord. See, that one's relatively new, I think. Anyway, uh, people, people are communicating this way. So we already discussed our in-person evangelism and discipleship. We discussed that Sunday morning, right? That is, uh, that is life groups, okay? That's gonna remain a fundamental, sort of the primary way that we do the proclamation of the gospel and discipleship. But there's a lot of other ways that we're gonna do it as well. So what we will need to be is the same thing we've been and or should be, and that is one, committed to regular physical attendance at Sunday morning services. Now, obviously we're in a pandemic and some of you cannot do that because it would be unwise for your health. And so you continue to be online live with us if it's possible at all to be live with us so you can be communicating, messaging uh, each other live. That's great. But if you can be here in person, be committed to being here every single Sunday, it's a pretty easy way of figuring it out. Generally speaking, generally, if you're not ill or out of town, you're here committed to being part of this body because you've been called here because we need you. It's not, don't, don't think, well, I don't really feel like I need them this week. Or I don't really feel like I need to sing or to have a message or to see anybody this week. It doesn't matter whether you feel like you need it. We need you. Be here, be committed Sunday morning. Next, committed to regular physical attendance at Life Group. Same caveat applies. I understand that some of you are unable to do that for health reasons. That's obvious. Just take that as, as an obvious thing in all of this. I understand that some of that exists. But generally speaking, be there live in person at your Life Group. Not because you need them, but because they need you. Now, the truth is you do need them. But if you can't see that for yourself, at least recognize that they need you. Be at your Life Group. And then the third thing is this, regular breaking of bread or drinking coffee with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Hang out with each other during the week. Make an effort to connect with the people in the church, not just in a very small group, but constantly expanding the group of people that you know and that you're in a real loving, accountability, growing relationship with. Constantly expanding that within the body. We need to have that. So do that weekly. Corporate worship, corporate study, corporate prayer, together, doing things together, whether that's two people in a coffee shop praying about uh, the other person's spouse, a husband or wife, or whether that's a life group praying about someone who's walking through some sin or some difficulty or some spiritual warfare and they're praying together, or whether that's on a Sunday morning and we're all lifting up the name of Jesus together, corporate worship, corporate study, corporate prayer, corporate fellowship. That's what we're doing. Next because those are things that we should be doing now. And if we're not, get on the stick on that. Be doing those things. That's what a disciple, a fully devoted follower of Christ looks like. Next, online. Online. We already have a number of opportunities for online growing proclamation of the gospel and discipleship. Okay? There's already quite a few that exist. This isn't our first foray into connecting with people online. We have the contemplate podcast. Those are roughly 20-minute podcasts of scripture teaching uh, that come out twice a week. There's actually, as of today, when this episode comes out, which I think, what's the 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th, 18th of October, uh, which I believe this is now five years, just as an aside. Um, I think October 16th, 2015 is the first time I preached uh, here. And so not in this building, we were in a different building, but, um, and so we're five years and two days in. Yeah, I'm pretty happy with it. I hope you guys are, are enjoying, for all my faults, are enjoying being with me because I sure enjoy being with you and love you. Um, but anyway, as of today, I believe there's 175 episodes of the Contemplate podcast. There's a lot of that that you could be sharing, learning from, discipling. 175 episodes, they continue to come out every Tuesday and every Thursday, 20 minutes or so. Perfect kind of drive time. If it takes you about 20 minutes to get to work, hit one of those up. They're also, they're wherever you can find podcasts, they're also on YouTube. So they're very easy to find online. 
We also have our live services Sundays at 11 a.m. Right now we're running them just the one time at 11 a.m. We may eventually run them for both of our services, or if we add services, we may run them multiple times. But right now we have a live service online at 11 a.m. Then our sermon messages are available online wherever you can get podcasts as well as on YouTube during the week. So you have all of those, there are tons and tons of those. I don't even know how many, and they're available on our website. A lot of this is available on our website also. We also have our old podcast series and we have uh, the Axe Casts that we were doing when, when we were kind of not able to meet in person. We did a bunch of these Axe Casts. Some of them have interviews with some great folks, actually, um, if you get a chance, pastors and, and writers and so on, um, or at least one writer. Anyway, there's, there's some stuff there for you to, to check out if you haven't. But we want to add to those things that are available where you can get podcasts, where you can get you know, on YouTube, on the internet, on our website. We want to add this. We want to add one, a daily scripture teaching live every morning, and then it'll be available live after the broadcast. But the, the hope will be that as many as possible show up live for scripture teaching. That's probably going to be teaching through, kind of like we do on Sunday mornings, that's probably going to be teaching through the Bible verse by verse, going just through it. Throughout the, the course of however long that takes, you know, the, I'm guessing these are going to be about 10 minutes long, but a morning teaching every single morning that's live online that you can get on. Two, a daily devotional, adding a daily devotional teaching each morning that's available uh, after it's live. It'll be available for anybody to do. And that's going to be more connected to practical holiness. So you have your scripture teach, and then you have one that's going to be a little more what I'd say topical. So we're going to be talking about how do you deal with grief? How do you deal with anger? How do you deal with these things? And going through the scriptural answers to those questions, teaching us practical holiness. How do we do all that Christ has commanded us? What are the steps to live in the spirit and to live in holiness and just to help with practical living? So those are the scripture teaching is one thing. The second one is really um, going to be great for not just us, but for those outside who are interested in how how people deal with these things and specifically how the people of Christ, how the people of God deal with these things. You're going to have that opportunity as those are going to be hopefully daily each morning that you could either watch live or you could watch them later, preferably that we watch them live together. Next, we want to provide a messaging application that is specific to Acts Church that we will have uh, groups of life groups will have their own group in it so that you're not using you know, Facebook Messenger or text or whatever. You'll have your own group within it. Um, the groups that do these morning devotions that are doing them live and so we'll have it. Sunday morning worship, we'll have a group for the whole church and so on. That'll be a messaging app that we have through a, through a partner that, that we will uh, be using um, paying uh, to provide that for us in an application for the church that you'll have on your phone. And that app will be the Acts Church app. You'll have access to everything I'm talking about, plus you'll have access to this messaging. So we can be messaging one another within our own application, right? And so that we're continually, it's, just, it's gonna add to the amount of communication that we have with one another as the church and then bringing others in. So we wanna have that going. And then we also wanna broadcast all of this live stuff, our live Sunday services and these live things, not just out to YouTube or to Facebook, but also you could go to our website and connect to us with all the live stuff. So you're gonna get the live streaming stuff on the website as well as where you're getting it now. The fact is, is that the marketplace, when Paul's going to the marketplace, for us, that is online. It is online, that's where it is. That's where people are gathering, that's where they're reading, that's where they're watching videos, that's where they're listening to ideas. I probably watch, I'm guessing myself, five, seven, 10, you know, short YouTube videos in a day that I'm catching some, some information from or something funny from or a cat that did something funny, whatever it is, I'm doing that. A lot of you are on social media or Facebook or Instagram or whatever, you're scrolling through those, you see X number of videos a day um, or you know, I read, when I read uh, news stories and so on, that's usually online. I don't get the physical paper anymore at my house. Some of you probably still do. I haven't for a long time. So I'm reading online, I'm listening online, I listen to a lot of stuff, podcasts, books, things like that. When I'm driving, I'm listening to stuff, I'm reading stuff, I'm seeing videos, I, I'm guessing that especially those younger than me, but even those older than me are also connecting with things online. Most of the content that we watch on television, we're streaming Netflix, Prime, and so on. That's another thing that we're looking to add is an application 
that you can get on your Apple TV or your Roku or whatever. That's an Axe Church application. You can get all of our content right there on your television. So we're looking to connect with a company that's going to give us support for all of those things at once so that everything we do shows up online, on our website, on our app, on our application, and then we'll have that messaging that goes with us so we're integrated and able to connect with each other as often as possible in this very busy world where we don't get as many chances to be physically together. Well, we will still maximize the opportunities to be physically together because that's primary. That's over these things. But these things should add to it. So these will be a way to evangelize, these will be a way to disciple effectively and efficiently. And we want to build the church up in our knowledge of the scripture. We want to build the church up in our ability to defend the truth of the gospel and to defend the faith in general, the reality of the existence of God, who he is, who we are. We want to be able to defend all those things. We've done lots of these series right? Where we're, we're talking about what's the questions of skeptics and so on. We want you to be able as a disciple, as you learn the scripture, we also want you to learn how to defend the scripture in season, out of season, to do it effectively, to do it with love. We want to teach that. We want to build up the church in practical holiness, actually living a holy life and knowing what we need to do to do that. Knowing how to constantly live in truth that we make good decisions. We want to do that. Living out the commands that Jesus Christ has given the church. That he's given to you, that he's given to me. We want to build up the church in service and leadership. Those are things we want to do. These things are not something that you're going to get very far on just on a Sunday morning. They're just not. You need, if you go to school uh, to get a degree, you go for, for a regular bachelor's degree or associate's degree is two-year, bachelor's degree is four-year, and then master's and doctor's, any number of years, right? And that's daily for the whole semester, however many hours, plus all the reading you do outside. I mean, it's, it's a serious commitment. Why would we think that our commitment to discipleship in Christ would be anything less? In fact, it's more. It's a lifetime of that very thing. We're always in school. The semester is always on. No summer vacation. We just learn and learn and grow and grow and we live in joy and peace because of it. So we want to have a life that looks like that and we want to provide for you the opportunity to have that. So we want to be soaked. Soaked in the truth of Jesus Christ so that it just defines us. It's just we live it out. We want to be set apart and different from the world. We especially want to do away with the idea that the church is something we do on Sundays and at life group, but not at work, but not with our family, but not at the dinner table, but not with our friends. We want to do away with that idea so that this is just something we're soaked in. We're just doing it constantly. We want to learn and grow and love the way God wants us to. So here's what I need from you. This is where you start taking some notes if you haven't already. One, prayer. We need to pray. And here are the things we need to pray for. We need you to be praying now for the elders and the pastors of Acts Church to have the wisdom for putting these things in place, to have the strength through the power of the Holy Spirit, the energy to put these things in place. And that the power of the Holy Spirit and the will of God would lead us, that we are following Christ in this. We need you to pray for yourselves and for your brothers and sisters in Christ to be passionate, to grow. Have a passion for growth and to take these opportunities because it's, it, whenever you institute something new, any of you have ever tried to like start running or working out or eat in a certain way or learning a certain skill or whatever, you recognize it takes a lot. If you, if you play an instrument, it's a lot of practice over a lot of time. You've got to be serious about it. So you've got to be passionate about growth or you just won't have the motivation to do this. So ask, pray for yourself, pray for your brothers and sisters that the Holy Spirit would inspire you to want to do this, that you might use these opportunities to grow closer to Jesus Christ, to grow closer to God. We need you to pray for confession and repentance in yourselves and in your brothers and sisters in Christ, in me and in the elders and in the pastors and in the staff and in the deacons and the people who work in Acts Kids and the people who volunteer out here and the people who just come sit in the seats, whatever, that we need to have confession and repentance as a regular discipline of our lives, that we might be right with God and have his favor that we might be able to do as well. Be praying for those things. Next, we need you to commit to the process. We need you to to Buy in to the vision that God has given us as his church and do it. We need you to commit to being involved in this increased discipleship, to being involved that you're going to set aside the time to get serious about your own discipleship journey, both for yourself and for those who you're discipling, that you want to be discipled, that you want to disciple others, that you want to grow either in leadership or in service or in hospitality or whatever God's calling you to as a person of the truth, as a person of the way, the truth, and the life of Jesus 
as a Christ follower, what are you being called to do? Pray about that and then commit to it. Commit to it. We need you to commit to be at church on Sunday mornings, subject to what I said already, and at Life Group during the week, and to take the time to break bread with your brothers and sisters in Christ and even with those who are in the world who you are trying to, who you're trying to proclaim the gospel to. Take the time. Who are you meeting with this week? Who are you going to coffee with? Who are you bringing over to your house for dinner? Who are you going bowling with? Who are you going to be around that you can just proclaim with your life and your words the gospel of Christ or that you could proclaim the good things about him and what he's commanded us to do to your brothers and sisters in Christ that you might teach them as they teach you? Who are you going to for advice, for counsel? How is your life soaked in the life of the church? Let's do that. We need you to commit to take these opportunities seriously, seriously, and use them to increase the time you spend in the scriptures. I'm excited for myself because it's easy for me to get into kind of a um, a verse of the day and then I'm I'm busy, I'm doing church stuff, but I'm not just soaked in the scripture. I'm really looking forward to new disciplines in my life to make sure I'm always in the scripture beyond just what I study so that I can teach, but just that personal great time with Jesus in the scripture for me, for you. Let's get, let's, let's commit, let's pray and let's commit to be serious about increasing the time we spend in the scriptures and in prayer. And then we really need you to commit to growing in practical holiness, learning how to follow Jesus' commands for you. You need to live that holy life. There is no peace when our life is not holy. There's no peace when our life is full of lies. There's no peace when our life is full of unrepentant sin those secret things that we can't seem to stop ourselves from, whatever they are, right? Some of us are gossips. Some of us are thieves. <laughs> some of us are, are sexually immoral. Some of us are whatever. We, we have these things. Some of us are addicted to substances, alcohol, or drugs, and, and we need help. Hey, listen, that's what this is about. Discipleship. Get in community and let people help you to grow. Have more accountability partners. Let's commit ourselves to practical holiness, learning how to follow Jesus Christ's command for you, for me. And we need you to share. We need you to share. We need you to share with your friends, your family, your social media connections, your social circle, your fellow workers, all of these people to share an invitation to join you on Sunday mornings live in person with us or and or to join you at your life group in person with your life group. But also share these opportunities that we create for online discipleship and proclamation of the gospel. Share them. Don't be afraid to consistently share these things. Say something about them. Say how they affected you this morning. You watched the thing and the devotion was strong and you, and you were grown by it. Say a few words and send it out so that people can see how it's affecting you so that other people might be drawn to Jesus. Through our love for one another, we just share that. Share it, share it. Share the gospel. Proclaim it, both with what you say, with what you write, with what you do. Share the gospel in season, out of season with your words and with your actions. And lead. Lead in your homes. Lead with your family and with your friends and with your co-workers and with the people around you. Lead with your acquaintances. Lead as a follower of Christ with integrity and with love. Be a person who stands apart from the crowd because of Jesus and because of what the Holy Spirit has done in you. Be a leader. You were called to be a disciple of Christ. That means you're following Christ, which means that you're leading those who, sh- who need to be following Christ or who are following Christ. Lead. Be a leader. I'm not talking about ordering people around. I'm talking about being an example of integrity, an example of love, an example of truth and mercy. Be like Jesus. We need to get excited about this. I'm excited about this. We need to get excited about this, that we're going to move into daily community with the messaging app, talking to one each other, with the daily teaching together. Let's get excited about it. Be excited about it. That's going to help you to pray for it. That's going to help you to get ready for it. We need to be excited about getting more serious about discipleship and evangelism than we have ever been in our lives. That Acts Church is just going to be a place where strong discipleship and evangelism has happened. Come what may. Let the enemy, enemy. Enemy is going to enemy, Okay. But we, no weapon formed against us shall stand. We have already won. We are more than conquerors. We have nothing to fear. If God is for us, who can be against us? Let's move forward in this and let's be excited about it. I want you to be excited. I'm excited and it's fun. Let's enjoy being Christ's disciples. 
like the church, from the beginning, we should be excited about evangelism. We should be excited about discipleship done effectively and efficiently. Let's pray. Father, I just ask that you would be with us, that in this thing that we're going to do, that you would give us strength, that you would give your people the strength and the passion to want to grow, that you would give the elders and the pastors the strength and the energy to do all the things that it takes to serve and minister, and that we would do so with a heart for others, putting others above ourselves, leading by following you, that people might be able to look to us and see you because you're working through us so efficiently. Holy Spirit, give us power to do this. Give us strength to do this. Enliven us, Lord, and let us catch what you're doing that we might be in your will and that many may come and that daily those who are being saved will be added to your church because the work that we're gonna do both in proclaiming your name and praising glory, evangelizing and discipling, being discipled and discipling others, God, just let us do it. Let us do the mission. Give us what we need to do. We love you, Lord, in your name, amen. Thanks again for listening. We hope the Lord blessed you through it. We'd like to invite you to join us on one of our Sunday morning services at either 9 a.m. or 11 a.m. Whether you would just like to find out some more info about Axe Church, or if you'd like to plug in and take some next steps in your faith, axechurchnw.org is a great place to start. You can also email us at info at axechurchnw.org. There's always more content coming, whether it's on YouTube or on our podcast channel. So be sure to subscribe to both of those to always get the newest content from Axe Church. Until next time, we hope you have a blessed week.